Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Mosaic Podcast. Today, I have, um, I think, a real treat for you. I, one, of, one of the things that I continually love about this podcast is people I meet are so aligned and so um, interesting. And I'm sitting here in the green room with James talking to him today. And he says to me, I have no idea why I said yes to this podcast, but there's just something that happened that occasionally it gets through. And, and I, I had no idea why he did too, because he's very prominent. He is, he is um, a professor and, of neuro, and in the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford University. And he's the director for the, of, of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education where he reaches, researches the neuroscience of compassion and altruism. And every time I read that, I see compassion and altism, and I have to correct myself to go altruism, which is amazing. Um, he, he is in touch and knows, and part of our conversation we were having before was about just intimate sort of conversations and time spent with some of the most um, respected spiritual leaders in, in the world. And yet he's, he's just himself. And I think that's one of the things that's so beautiful about it, when we can just be ourselves with everybody, no matter who they are. But of all the accolades that he's gotten, and there are many, and you can see his book is in, called Into the Magic Shop. Um, you'll see all the people that have written testimonials for him. Uh, you'll see the Dalai Lama. You'll see Thich Nhat Hanh, You'll see tons of people that are really, really well known that James knows, and, and they're friends of his. But of all those accolades, one of the things that I find most interesting because of the Mosaic podcast is all about this moment when things that used to be a certain way in one moment change. And the moment that most interests me in his life happened a long time ago. It was when he grew up in a home that was sort of a rough home to be in in a situation that wasn't what he, he, he's in now. And he just happened into a magic shop in search of a plastic thumb. I'm going to leave it there for a moment because we'll come back and talk about it, I'm sure. But Dr. James, welcome to the Mosaic Podcast. What an honor it is to have you with us today. Well, uh, it's my honor, and thank you for having me. I appreciate the invitation, and you're right. I have no fucking clue why I agreed to talk to you, but uh, uh, here we are. Uh, Most people say that <laughs> after they've spoken to me, not before. <laughs> um, so if you don't mind, would you give us a little history? Would you would, Tell me what your parents did, because I know that's a pretty big part of your life. Sure. Uh, my father uh, was an electrician, although he was frequently unemployed. He was an alcoholic, a binge drinker. And uh, I never knew from one day to another whether he was going to show up at home or disappear for days to weeks, or I would uh, be called from jail or our family would uh, and have to bail him out or if he had wrecked a car or whatever. Uh, this was sort of an ongoing uh, tragedy, actually. And my mother uh, had had a stroke when I was a young child and was partially paralyzed and had a seizure disorder. And she was chronically depressed, attempted suicide uh, multiple times. Uh, neither of my parents went to college. Um, we lived on public assistance essentially my entire life as a child and uh, evicted multiple times uh, from different uh, residences. So, of course, this is not the ideal environment for a child to grow up and, quote, unquote, be successful in society. And, in fact, I think uh, the reality is, in those types of circumstances, very few children come out unscathed, certainly. In fact, I don't think any come out unscathed, but for them to achieve, I think, is, is quite rare. What separated me uh, ultimately from most people is that at the age of 12, I uh, had ridden my bike far beyond where I normally would go. And it led me to a strip mall where there was a magic shop. And I was, was an amateur magician, if you will. And one of the tricks I would do was with a plastic thumb and you could put a cigarette butt in there and hide it or a, a handkerchief or something and pretend it disappeared. And I had lost my thumb. 
So I went in there to see if I could get another one. And I walked in and there was this woman at the counter who had this radiant smile. And uh, it's amazing what somebody who has a radiant smile, what that can mean to someone. At that point in my life, I was filled with anger, hostility, despair, hopelessness. And uh, the fact that this woman had this incredible smile that essentially embraced me made me feel immediately comfortable. And she was reading a paperback book. She had glasses on her nose with a chain. And I described her as an earth mother. She had this wavy uh, gray hair. And she looked up from her book with this smile and uh, started. Uh, we started a conversation. It turned out she was the owner's mother. The owner uh, wasn't there. He was running an errand. And she knew nothing about plastic thumbs or magic. Uh, but we began a conversation. And you have to remember, this was in 1968. This was before uh, people talked about meditation, mindfulness, uh, neuroplasticity. And this woman, after a fairly brief conversation in which she asked some fairly penetrating questions, which normally I was too ashamed to answer, I did answer. She said to me, she said, you know, I really like you and I'm here for another six weeks. If you come in every day, uh, I think I could teach you something. And uh, I did. I showed up every day. And over a period of six weeks, we would spend one to two hours uh, a day in the back room of this magic shop, which if you think about it, a 50-some-year-old woman <laughs> in a back room with a 12-year-old right. uh, is a little weird. Uh, but uh, it was quite innocent. And uh, over that period of time, she taught me what is now would be considered a uh, mindfulness practice. And uh, uh, more importantly, in addition to that practice, which made me understand the importance of being present and attending, because you cannot learn, you cannot achieve unless you can attend. And people who grew up in the environment I grew up in uh, have a form of constant trauma and a form of post-traumatic stress disorder where their life is chaos and they never know what's going to happen. And so they can never attend because they're not sure what's going to happen to them next. They have to always be diligent and vigilant. And so uh, this gave me this ability though to calm myself, to relax my body, to breathe in and out and to shift from the stress mode or my sympathetic nervous system to this parasympathetic nervous system, which allowed me to attend, it allowed me to be much more thoughtful, it allowed me to be present. And then from that, it made me understand that the negative dialogue or self-talk that I had uh, wasn't real, that it was a construed narrative uh, that had nothing to do with reality. But it was that narrative that for myself, and I believe literally millions of people, it's a narrative that people have a tendency to believe and that limits them from reaching their full potential. Yeah. And so she taught me that reality. And then she taught me what we would now describe as a self-compassion technique um, to change that narrative to one of positivity, one of acceptance, one of kindness, one of affirmation. And then what that did was it made me see the world a different way because I based on my own fears, anxieties, anger, hostility, I perceived the world that way. And once I opened my heart, if you will, and understood that everyone is suffering and understood that uh, I, it wasn't about me always uh, and could see other people, I say it allowed me to see the true nature of reality. And, uh, and in my book, which you alluded to, what I say is that once I changed how I reacted to the world, the world changed how it reacted to me. Right, of course. Because as, as, yeah, as a species, we have this innate ability to, and it happens at a subconscious level for most of us, to intuit facial expressions, to uh, respond to intonation of voice, body habitus, even smell. And you know, when you come across somebody who is angry and hostile, you immediately have a sense of it oftentimes and you typically avoid those people or shut down or you kick in your own sympathetic nervous system uh, and your fear response. So uh, what happened is when I changed how I saw the world, suddenly people responded to me in a much more positive way. And that interaction with her, those lessons 
as well as the last lesson which she taught me was a technique to manifest my intention which nowadays we would call a visualization technique that's often used in athletics uh change the trajectory of my life because what happened was i went from a perception of myself as having no power or limited yeah. power to the realization that each of us has unlimited power we wow. just don't know it huge change uh, huge change so uh it allowed me to believe I could go to college and created the circumstances that allowed for that to happen, to go to medical school, to become a neurosurgeon, to become a professor of neurosurgery at Nomaly, one of the best academic institutions in the world, and to become a successful entrepreneur, CEO of a company that went public for $1.2 billion. It allowed me to start this center, which at the time, no other center was focused on the study of compassion. And in fact, I'll tell you, I was told that the academic study of compassion was a dead end because it was soft and squishy and had no meaning. And what we know nowadays after myself being in this space for about 12 years is this is one of the most powerful areas of research right now. It has huge profound impact on health, mental and physical health. And uh, fundamentally as a species, uh, what has allowed us to survive and thrive is the underlying uh, reality that compassion is the most powerful attribute that we have. Beautiful. And, and so what I love, there's so much to unpack in that story that I, I wish I had like six hours with you, but I just want to touch on a couple of things that I heard and just see if you, if I'm hearing them correctly. What I love about the story of the way you grew up and the woman that you met in the magic shop, who wasn't even the magician, who wasn't even the magician for the magic shop, but the mother, uh, I mean, just a happenstance that she happened to be there when you came in. Um, you're, you had already been told by life that there was no chance that things were going to work. People that grew up in the situation that you grew up don't end up doing the things that you did. So when you started the school of this, this, um, Center for Compassion in, in academia, being told that it's, 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 not, it's not possible was something that you'd already seen times and time again in your life and had walked past. But for people that are listening now who sort of drop their jaw, some of them may be in the situation you were in. Some of them may be wondering, how do I get a break like that? What actually happens? Would you go into this idea, because we say it and, it, and we all understand it in words, but will you go into this idea of the way, when I change the way I see the world, the world I see changes? Yes. Uh, uh, you know, as I explained a minute ago, uh, when we have anger and hostility, people sense that, and it scares them. And, uh, and people who might nominally want to help you or reach out to you are they pull back oftentimes. And so the other aspect of this that I think is really important and that people have to learn is that one is it's not all about them. And what I mean by that is oftentimes we wallow in our anger and hostility and it impacts everything we do, but anger and hostility, where do they come from? They don't come from external events. They yeah. come from inside us. Yeah. And uh, huge, point. huge point. Huge point for a minute. Because I, I, when, when we know that between you and I, we know that. But for anybody who's listening who doesn't know that, sit right there for a minute. Like allow yourself to put this on pause and ask yourself, where does your anger and resentment really come from? And, and then come back. But sit there for a minute and just allow that to absorb. Okay. And I think what uh, happens is that you're so tied up in this feeling that, well, the world's mean to me. If so and so had been nice to me, if I hadn't grown up with these parents, if I uh, didn't have this happen to me, everything would have been perfect. And the fact of the matter is, life is not perfect, no matter your circumstance, number right. one. But number two is, an understanding that the gift you have is the gift to create how you respond to things. 
it's not the events that cause you discomfort, it's you yourself. And I think the thing I learned was I could sit all day long and be angry and hostile, and it did nothing for me. And in fact, uh, uh, what happens oftentimes is that uh, it actually has a huge negative effect. Uh, so there's this concept uh, uh, <clears throat> that's frequently used in uh, Eastern uh, religious traditions called uh, equanimity. And it's this understanding that life is going to have ups and downs and your challenge is to have an evenness of temperament. Uh, and what I mean by that is that I love it when I do something and get accolades for it and, or a reward or have achieved something. But the fact of the matter is that is transitory. Yes. It will not last. And what makes people also unhappy is craving and attachment to those types of situations. Yeah. To always be up, to always have something great happening, to always be told how great you are. And if that's always what you're striving for, you're going to create your own unhappiness. The other interesting reality is, uh, and I can certainly say from experience, is that the downtimes when, in fact, events have occurred which are negative and you feel in pain, you feel hurt, you feel challenged, those are actually in some ways gifts. And I know it never seems that way at the time because you feel like shit and you wish you were somewhere else. But if you take a little further in time, what happens is that you realize that you learn who you are. You learn your, your resilience. You learn incredible life lessons that give you insights and awareness of how to lead your life. Okay. And oftentimes, it's the down times that are the experiences that make us who we are, uh, make us see the world in a different way and actually become better people. And so, uh, go ahead. Well, in a lot of ways, it's what gives us compassion to other people that are going through some of those same things it, when, when we go through some of those down times. What I wanna do is, if I can, I wanna reel back in again, because I'm so interested in this moment where you met this woman in the magic shop. Because here's, what, here's what's sitting with me that doesn't quite, that I want, that doesn't quite, here is this angry kid growing up with parents that really weren't there for him. You didn't know if your father was going to come home. You didn't know when he came home, how he was going to be. Your mother had, had a stroke and wasn't able to really function in the way that a mom, it's not like the standard Ozzy and Harriet mom, you know, where, where she, you come home and there's cookies and milk on the table. And no. you're, you're, and you're angry. You're upset. You're, you, you haven't felt listened to. You haven't felt acknowledged. You haven't felt validated. You haven't felt heard. You haven't felt loved. What was it that this woman did when you, I, I mean, I know she taught you all sorts of things, but how does that angry kid see this woman in this magic shop and allow her to do that? What did she give you before she gave you her words and her wisdom? Well, there's this term psychological safety, and uh, that's what she gave. And what is psychological safety? It's someone uh, being open, this radiant smile. It's someone who is non judgmental. And you know, all of us uh, look at other people and we have biases. You know, if someone's not dressed well, if they look disheveled, if they have an accent, uh, if they're a different color, whatever it is, creates a set of biases. And those biases also affect the interaction. So someone to not judge you about your background or who you are, or even your age, uh, someone who looks at you as an equal. You know, I was 12 years old, but she didn't make me feel like I was 12. Yeah. She made me feel like we were two people equal having a conversation. I love this because so this is the point that I'm in, really really interested in, and you're and you're brilliant in this. So I'm really wanting your brilliance to to help to share sh shed light on this for me. The way we perceive the world is the world that we end up seeing, but you perceived the world a certain way until you intersected with somebody who perceived the world a different way, 
And in that intersection of the way she perceived the world and the way you perceived the world, something changed. And it was you that changed in that particular moment because the resonance of what she had was more powerful than the resonance of what you had. You didn't, you didn't depress her and, and put her down, which, is, which in many cases is what people would believe would happen. Like I go in, I have that black cloud on my head, like Linus or, or whatever it is in the Charlie Brown comics, and we walk with this black cloud and nobody wants to do it. But when somebody takes the time who has, who, who has clarity and, and, and wisdom and compassion and love and intersects with that black cloud, the black cloud, what happened to that? Like, that's the point I'm trying to get at. Like, yes, she was compassionate. Yes, she, she didn't judge you. Yes, she didn't do that. But what happened to the angry kid? Did it just melt away? Well, I won't say it just melted away, but over a period of time, it melted away. And, and I think what happened is it's as if you walked over to a window that was quite dirty and suddenly, uh, and, you, and no lights coming through yeah. and you have a, a, a wet rag and you start cleaning it. And then suddenly a little bit of light comes through and you go, oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't even know there was light on the other side. Then you get a little, clear, a little more clear and you go, wow, there's some interesting things going on over there. And look at all the people over there who seem happy. Then you clean a little bit more. And then suddenly, I would say, you see the true nature of reality. And this is being able to live, uh, and it's very difficult to do, without that cloud of our biases. And yeah. the reality is, unless you know about these biases, you believe that your worldview is the correct worldview. Yeah. And, uh, and again, it has to do with cleaning that window. The more you clean it, what do you see? You no longer see separateness from the other. You see oneness. Yeah. That's when it's absolutely clean. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I love it because without knowing it, we don't know each other. We met each other 18 seconds ago. So we don't know each other at all. But the book that I wrote, The Mosaic, is a fable about a boy who loses his parents two years apart on the same day. And when he asks the adults where his parents are, they tell him they're in a place called heaven. So he sets out in search of the place called heaven. But the people that he meets along the way are not the holy men and the rabbis and the priests and the swamis and the gurus. The people that he meets along the way are the trash man and the blind woman and the homeless guy and the street artist. And he wonders, why am I meeting those people? And his first bias is that these people are, you know, low down, insignificant, nothing of people. But when he sits and listens to them, and he says, I'm here with them. I might as well listen to them. Why don't I listen to what their story is? When he listens to their story, what he sees is he didn't see them at all. The person he saw initially is not at all who they are. And when he has that happen over and over and over again, he, leans, he looks over to the right and he sees a monk unzipping the sky and inviting him to walk through to a parallel reality, which is which, at where he meets the wise one who's the keeper of the mosaic. And so... What you're saying so corresponds with everything that I, I've written about in a, in a fable, which is a beautiful little story. But I love this idea that the way we perceive the world is just that. It's the way we perceive the world. It is not the world that is out there. And one change of perception. And for me, it all comes down to when we take the time to listen to another human being a world opens up within that other human being because all of us have something to say and want to say something. No, that's exactly right. And, and the thing is, some of the greatest wisdom I have learned, some of the most powerful insights are not from gurus. They're from average people. Yeah. And maybe uh, they are, in fact, the gurus, as you point out in your book. Uh, and we forget that. Again, it's the same biases that we can't learn from other people. And of course, one of the things uh, that is taught in uh, Buddhist practice is this idea of the beginner's mind. You make no assumptions about anything. And that's hard to do, uh, especially the more accomplished you become. You create this ego narrative of how you know a lot and uh, people know less than you. And it's something very dangerous you have to watch for. You know, I'll tell you a very quick story that aligns actually with uh, your book. Uh, when I was in college, I worked at a liquor store. And, you know, I'm in college now, and I thought I was a hotshot. 
and uh, I'm working in this liquor store, and there's a gentleman who came in every day and bought a quart of vodka. And of course, you know, with my own father, who was an alcoholic, and my own uh, baggage, you know, I dismissed the person, I was rude to him, I made fun of him. And um, one day I did this, and he called me on it. Hmm. And he looked at me, and he said, you sit there so smart and so smug, you know, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I was, of course, taken aback. You're and, still taken uh, back to this moment because as, as you're telling the story, I can feel the emotion in it for you. Well, what happens is he shares with me his story. And his story is that he was a university professor. Wow. And his uh, daughter had died unexpectedly in an accident then his wife died of cancer wow and those two people were his acre wow right yeah 100 so so suddenly you know here's this guy who's quite accomplished and he's been set adrift yeah because everything he had yeah. That he held to was God. Yeah. And again, if you have nothing to lose, if you don't see yourself as anything anymore, yeah. you don't see yourself as having a future, nothing matters. And the degree of pain uh, that he had uh, was assuaged by his drinking. Yeah. Uh, and of course, in my arrogant way, I, I was beating this poor guy up, knowing nothing about him. Of course. But what is extraordinary is, is uh, that he and I became friends. Wow. So after that moment, he still came in. He would buy his vodka. and But we would sit and talk. Yeah. And I shared a bit about my background. And he ended up starting giving me advice. Wow. Then what happened is it went from uh, a, a quart of vodka to a pint of vodka to one of those little airline bottles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Till no vodka. Yeah. Uh, at, at, over this progression, which lasted almost a year, yeah. he changes from sort of this slovenly dress sort of hair looks like he just crawled out of bed smelling actually to suddenly coming in with a sport coat on wow. looking cared for wow and each of us needed each other at that moment a hundred thousand percent I, I i so thank you for that story and you're right it is exactly my book and when i finished writing my book my book actually spoke to me and said I want you to go out on the road and I want you to do what I did. I want you to walk and meet the people that are out there. And so I'm about to start May, May 1st, a one year journey Wonderful. around, around America to sit with the people that nobody sits with and to listen to the people that nobody listens to. And the, one of the reasons I want to do that is because one of the people that I met as I started to do this now is I sat with a man who was homeless and I watched him for a while and, and I saw him and I, I asked if I could come and sit with him. And we spoke for a little bit and I, sa I said, tell me about, tell me what you see on this corner because you watch the same people walk by all the time. What do you see? He said, I'm an empath. So I feel people's hatred of me. I feel the way they treat me and the, and the way they think of me. It's worse than a, an animal. Um, and, and, people come and beat me sometimes and kick me and spit on me. And, and he said, one day I decided enough was enough. I, I had nobody that cared about me and sitting here, I, I was just the, the ridicule and, and, and shame of all the people that walked by me. So I decided I was going to go around the corner and, and take my life. And he said, one man, right as I had that thought came up and put his hand on my shoulder and asked me, how, how are you? And he said he's, he had the kindness to spend 10 minutes with me and just listen to me without judging me, without saying anything. And he said, 
when he left, he had no idea the impact that he had. I couldn't kill myself anymore because somebody actually cared about me. Well, Corey has no, no idea the impact that he had on me. Hearing his story said, if we would only spend 10 minutes with, with people and listen to what they have to say, that's what's motivating my trip around the, uh, around the country. And if I can do it because I'm, I'm, my body's old, my body's pain and pain, if I can last through it, then it will become a trip around the world, which I want to film and create a docu-series called, or a, docu or a documentary called The Voice of the Voiceless. Because look at what happened in even just the short time that you and I are speaking when we remove ourselves from the accolades of who we are and just remember that simple man that walked into the liquor store or I remember the homeless guy. It just, it, it, it not only changes the way we see the world, it actually changes the vibration of our being that we exist in the world. Like I can see that that, that man is still with you. I can feel the, the I can feel your, for those people who aren't seeing this on video, you can feel almost the tears coming up in, in, in eyes. So I just want to thank you for switching. And, and it was, a, it was a, such a noticeable switch. Not that you weren't a good guy and, and kind and, 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 and honest and just open. But the noticeable shift that went from what the hell am I doing speaking to this guy and why am I here? to that person that became very vulnerable and real and honest and told that story is what I want people to see because when we take that time and everybody wants it, everybody just wants to be listened to and heard. You know, it's funny when I <clears throat> started this compassion center, I would have people who would, make an appointment to see, to talk to me in my neurosurgery office, <laughs> not as patients, but just to talk to me. And what a large number of those people were, were those people, yeah. people who had suffered and wanted somebody to sit and hear their story and say, you know, you did the best you could. It was difficult for you. I know, but you're not to blame for the situation you know, you're fortunate because you're special and this allowed you to get to where you are today, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I would do this uh, for a period of time. And suddenly at some point in that conversation, that person would burst into tears and say, thank you. No one had ever listened to my story before. Yeah. And then I would sit there and hug them for about five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and my staff, then they would leave my office we paid uh, from this catharsis and my staff would go, there goes another one. And, uh, uh, but I had to stop doing it because first of all, I only have so many hours in the day. Yeah. Uh, my job is to be a neurosurgeon as much as, uh, you know, uh, I like doing that. But the other aspect is to do that and be present for somebody takes them like that takes an immense amount of energy. Totally. totally. And, uh, uh, but what I would say is that, this idea of what we're talking about, of making an effort to break down the barriers between you and another, listening to someone, can be one of the greatest gifts we give to ourselves. Yes. This is what we forget. It is a gift for that person oftentimes, but you yourself are the biggest winner. And you know, the Dalai Lama says, uh, uh, what's the quote? Uh, uh, if you want to be happy, uh, practice compassion. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. And I think that's uh, absolutely uh, the case. And as you noticed, uh, you know, I uh, became emotional and I make no effort to hide my emotion. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, you know, the sad thing is people do make an effort. Of course because they feel they're going to be judged yeah. uh, as weak uh, or a wimp. And that by showing emotion, by crying, by having your voice crack, the people will somehow make fun of them or think lesser of them. And then the fact of the matter is, when you're able to do that, that's not a sign of weakness, actually. That's a sign of extraordinary power. 
Yes. And I have no problem getting in front of in front of a, a hundred people, a thousand people, or ten thousand people, and showing my vulnerability. Because the amazing thing that happens as soon as I show my vulnerability, a hundred gives permission for yeah. others to show theirs, and that's where people want to be, because it makes them feel good. <clears throat> it takes a burden off of them because it allows them to touch their heart and their emotion. Yeah. And uh, it's funny, I gave a lecture one time in a similar type of situation where I was teary or <clears throat> my voice was cracking. And a psychiatrist afterwards comes up to me. This woman says to me, she says, you know, I felt so sorry for you up on stage <laughs> and your voice was cracking. You must have been so embarrassed and like it hurt me to watch wow. you like that. And she said, you know, I'm wow. a hypnotist. I'm a psychiatrist. And, you know, if you spent three sessions with me, I could get rid of that. <laughs> of course. Thank you very much. And I, if you spend yeah. three sessions with me, I'll help you to have that. I mean, yeah, people are, are so stuck at wanting to sell their services that they don't even see the beauty that's standing right in front of them. Well, and the thing is, the, the reality is one of the things that I believe makes people want to talk with me actually is that yeah look uh you know there are all sorts of people who can wax poetically about compassion or give mm -hmm. a scientific discussion that's quite academic but there are very very few people can you hold, <laughs> hold my son is texting me yeah let that's me okay. respond that's a compassionate uh, response yes So as you're, as you're doing that, one of the things that I think I just will, will occupy the time for the audio that when people for the podcast, <laughs> um, one, of, one of the things that I think is just so beautiful is that when we meet people that their wall is down and they are just themselves and they're vulnerable and open and they're, and, and you see them as they are rather than this persona of what we do is we put these silos around ourselves and these walls around ourselves and we paint them to look a certain way so that everybody sees us the way we want we think they should we want them to see us but they don't really see us at all and part of the reason why there's no intimacy in the world is because there's no into me see what my walls meeting your wall when we meet and when we bring those walls down that's where compassion can happen that's where love can happen so because i know we're, we're sensitive on time I just want to ask you the one question that I always end every podcast with. But, well, let me just comment Finish your on story. that, because, yeah, uh, because you're absolutely correct uh, about that. Uh, and you asked me about spiritual leaders a little before we started recording this discussion. Yeah. What happens to all of us is, you know, 100 or 200 years ago, we lived in a village. We lived with our parents, our grandparents. Uh, siblings, neighbors, grew up our entire lives. And in that environment, we felt safe. Yes, yes. That everyone around us saw us at our worst, they saw us at our best, and guess yeah. what, they still loved us. Yeah. And what happened is, as we modernized our society, no longer do people live with parents or grandparents. Their siblings are often far distant as are other relatives. And they're in a job, they may not even know the person. And this is in part what creates this uh, shield or barrier people put up to say, I'm this, I'm accomplished, I'm right. so-and-so. And the problem, of course, as you point out, that's the separator. Because unless you can be authentic, the other person's not authentic. And you just go back and forth, never really saying anything. And when you're in the presence of the Dalai Lama or Amma or one of these spiritual leaders, what's extraordinary about these evolved spiritual leaders is they look at you as you. They don't care about your shadow. They don't care about what you've done or haven't done. They're just embracing you with unconditional love. Yeah. And in some ways, this is what this conversation is about, is the ability to give unconditional love. And as soon as you do that, what happens is the need to carry this shield, which comes at a significant psychological cost is broken down yep. and you're suddenly who you are and you're joyful 
because you don't have to carry the shield. You don't have to prove yeah. yourself. You don't have to do anything. You just have to be you. I love and that. And you're loved for being you. And I think that is the power of all of this. Yeah. That's what this woman taught me. That's the gift that we have is to be non judgmental, to accept others. It will enhance our lives, it will enhance their lives, and actually it makes the world uh, work a lot better. Love it. In my book, in The Mosaic, there's one of the characters is a mirror maker. And Mo is walking along and, and comes into this village and it's the only store that's open. So he walks in because he hasn't seen anybody for a long time because he's been on a journey and he hasn't, he hasn't come across people. So he walks into the store and he sees these exquisite mirrors all up, over the place. And he looks around and he thinks should, nobody's coming up to see him. And he, he wonders if she should say hello, hello, but he's not going to buy a mirror because he's just walking. He just wants to see somebody. And eventually he stops at this beautiful, it's a brass mirror. It's a mirror made of brass, but it shines so brightly that he can see himself perfectly. And the mirror maker comes up behind him and she says, um, I see you found the mirror you like. And he says, yeah, this is the most exquisite mirror I've ever seen. And she says, so tell me, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? And he starts to tell him all the stories of himself that he, see, that he sees. And she says, no, I know that you know how to see what you can't see because you found our shop and nobody else can find us. But I want to know now, not the stories that you tell yourself when you look in the mirror. I want to know what the mirror shows back to you because the mirror doesn't see your stories. It sees you. And in some ways, when you talk about the saints that you've met and the people that you've stopped to and the, and, and the deeply, they're mirrors. They're brilliant mirrors that show us ourselves as we really are. And that's the mirror maker. So first of all, thank you again so much. Um, the question I always ask closing, because I know we have time constraints. When you look out the window at the world that's out there today, is this the world you always dreamed of handing over to your children and your children's children? No, but what I do see is infinite possibility of that happening. And what it happens. It, go ahead. What would it take to go from that no to that infinite possibility? And what's one thing people could do right now that would help to move from the world that is a no to the possibility? to treat every person uh, how they would like to be treated and to remove the barrier that separates uh, to understand that what you do for another <clears throat> is what you do for yourself because the other is in fact you. Mm. Mm. And if you view the world that way, there is the reality that the world will become the place we each want it to be. Yeah. I love that. And again, just in the image of a mosaic, we are, we are pieces, but when, when our individual pieces come together and realize we're connected, not separate, we create the most exquisite artistry that could ever be seen. Because on our own, we're just a color or a shape or a size or, or a texture. But when we come together with other colors, shapes and sizes and textures, we create this mosaic that is one piece, that is one whole, that is made up of all the pieces that seem so real in their separateness, but are not real at all in their, in their wholeness. And so what an honor to sit with you and talk. I would love to talk with you under separate cover uh, about this trip that I'm going on, I'm looking for sponsorship and I'm looking for maybe people that might be able to, to um, support it in some way or another. And so I would love to have a conversation with you about that off camera. For people who want to know more about you and how to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Uh, one way is you can go to CCARE, ccare.stanford.edu, which is the center that I founded at Stanford that studies compassion and altruism. The other is to go to the website for the book, which is called intothemagicshop.com. And the third is uh, jamesrdodmd.com, which covers the gamut of stuff that I do. Um, 
And I would suggest that what you just said, every person should listen to, uh, to make an effort to contribute to what you're doing, because what you're doing is giving a light on, uh, sadly, uh, some dark places. But when a light is put in those dark places, what you find are treasures. And uh, in some ways, uh, you're on a treasure hunt. But the reality is, uh, the treasure is all around you. Yes. When I realized the reason I was going out was not to fix the world, but to hear my voice and the voice of the others that I speak to, to sit with people in the Ku Klux Klan and hear their hatred, but understand that that's my hatred spoken in a different language, to see the, to see the compassion of people around me and the goodness and the world that exists in people when we get away from the television and the little boxes that we carry in our pocket and we just sit face to face with people and we understand the in supreme goodness that exists, the supreme love and caring. Well, hate comes from pain. And uh, I would suggest to you that anyone who uh, spews hatred, uh, they're really damaged. And sadly, what happens for many of us, we sit like that 12-year-old child, feeling the pain, the hurt that has happened to us. And we're still that same 12-year-old child when we're an adult. Yes. And we carry that with us. And only when you can understand that and heal that 12 year old child. And that 12 year old child can only be healed by love and compassion. And that's what change hearts and minds. It's not uh, telling someone they're wrong. Mm -hmm. It's sitting with them and trying to understand. Do you have one more moment for me to share the story of my daughter with you? I know you have to go. If you have to go, say I have no. to go. Okay, you got it. We'll do it again. Okay, we'll do it again. I look forward to that. I look forward to it. Okay. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking a risk and just showing up on the show. I think what came out of it for me was incredibly valuable, and I'm sure the listeners will get incredible value too. And, and why haven't you sent me your book, damn it? I will send it to you today. <laughs> I want you to okay, read it. Friend. I would love you to read it. So I'll, I'll yes. get with your people and get your address and send you a hard copy as well, signed. Um, thank you again for everything. For those people who have spent their time listening to this and to come back to the show over and over again, I can't thank you enough for the gift of your time and for the gift of Dr. James being here with us. Um, support what he's doing. Go to his websites. All that information will be down below. Support him in the work that he's doing. Support the compassion that he's, he's trying to share into the world. Support the Sea Care Center at Stanford. Um, and support this movement that's happening in the world where just one person intersecting with another person can change the world, just like the woman changed James when he met her. Absolutely. Every day, each of us has the capacity to make one person's life better, period. Bam. Try that. I love it. Thank Take you care, so much, my James. Pleasure. See you. Honored to talk to you. Ciao.